over the last 100 years, more than 80% of all the available forests in this country have been depleted. As a result of this, we are feeling the impact of climate change and farming communities are particularly bearing the brunt of it. In this documentary, When the Last Tree Dies, we explore the impact that global warming is having on local communities here in Ghana and ask the question, what can be done to save our environment? Ghana used to have an immense forest cover, lush vegetation, spans of rainforest, timber and tree species, some as old as a hundred years. But within the last century, a lot has changed. The forest cover throughout the country has been planted. Without mercy for this gift of nature, the forests have been ransacked. Millions of hectares of the beautiful green vegetation lost. What is left is just 1.6 million hectares or the size of 1.6 million football fields put together, down from 8.2 million hectares a hundred years ago. And that is scary, since the current situation exposes all of us to the dangerous impact of climate change. Formerly, you see, you saw this, our forest range. It was helping the community, that of the rain pattern. By this time, because they have got into the forest to saw some of the wood, you see that now the pattern has changed and we don't have enough rainfall. In this edition of Hotline, we take you on a tour across the country to hear how deforestation is negatively impacting farming activities and how communities are struggling to cope. That is a great problem. Sometimes you go to the farm, you really, you really like to farm, uh, to work, because the sun has scorched everything. This cassava in the field at Mafia Kukokbo in the Volta region was planted 14 months ago. It matured and was ready for harvest five months ago. But they can't harvest because the grounds are too hard. They would usually harvest after they see the first rain of the year, which substances the ground but is delayed and the cassava is rotting in the field. The grounds are hard, it's not raining. That is why we cannot approve the cassava. But previously, the rain came as was expected. Other farmers in the enclave are complaining too. The change of the weather is affecting us because usually when the rain sets in early, we also get, we get happy. But this time around, you could see that the rain will be late. You could see that when I've planted this maize, only twice that it rains this year in our area here, so it has affected. If not, you should have seen that the, the means are doing better than what you are seeing now. Yeah. He is aware the destruction of the forest the is responsible for the so phenomenon. The one that I think I'll that do. it's burning of the bush and some activities are causing that. Yeah. So, you know, in dry season, they usually burn bush around these areas for bush meat. Yeah, so that's also affecting the weather, I could see. And cutting of trees, they have been cutting the trees for uh, charcoal. In the absence of trees, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere increases, which traps a lot of heat in the air. This interrupts the development of clouds to allow for rainfall. And when eventually the rain comes, it's heavy, causing floods. Okay. This results in climate change and creates an unpredictable rainfall pattern. Glenn Asumening is with the Nature and Development Foundation. The destruction of forests contribute greenhouse, greenhouse gases, uh, which is also a contributor, carbon dioxide mainly, and sometimes methane, which is also a contributor to the, you know, the problem of climate change. Whatever you do, it's a cause and effect relationship. Yeah, so um, the more damage you cause, the more impact you feel from climate change. The trees on the ground, I'm sure our primary and junior high science taught us photosynthesis. We gain oxygen from them after production of carbon dioxide. And these are the things that society world over has grown to realize that we are shortening our own human life by not taking good care of these resources. 
In several parts of the Volta region, the chopping down of trees and shrubs to burn charcoal in the deep forest is good business. Driving through Adaklukbachu, I see a lot of this happening. Akoto Christian is a farmer and charcoal dealer. His work is very harmful to the forest and vegetation. But as far as Christian and many others in this community are concerned, this work feeds a lot of the families in the area. A bag of charcoal can be sold for about 90 cities during the rainy season, so it's good business. It is sometimes more profitable than farming. But Akoto also sees the impact of the charcoal business on our great productivity. The rains have delayed here for two months now, and two of the fields are empty. This year, the rain hasn't come, so the grounds are not good for farming. But in some other communities, destruction of the forest is not simply an activity by locals to make a living through charcoal production. By law, you will require a permit from the Forestry Commission in other to fell trees. The Commission's job is to ensure such harvesting is done in a sustainable manner. So it is hauled from the stamp side after the TF has been captured and then brought here to the side. So this is what we call the side or the log yard. So when the tree is brought here, they cross cut them based on their own contract dimension. They reserve the right to do so. Uh, and then a timber truck can just move from town all the way to this portion. It comes, turns around, and then the logs are loaded onto it. But illegal timber merchants are defying this requirement in the law that establishes the commission. The illegal loggers move into the forest late at night to cut down trees and move them out with impunity. Some even in the night, you will be asleep. And then in the night, you will hear the machine sounding in the bush. Before you are aware, you, before you get there, you, they are gone. They have finished sowing the trees and then collected the wood and then away. And it gets more serious as the legal timber merchants move the illegally cut trees through some of these forests. They end up destroying the farms of ordinary farmers. Daniel Odami, a cocoa farmer in the Jassikan district, lost 2,000 Ghana cities after illegal loggers destroyed his two-acre cocoa farm. He came and fell some trees on my cocoa. Uh, but I think then, but to no avail because I don't know where they come from. It was easy. I have to labor. I mean, uh -huh. But formerly, the cuckoo have been helping me. But now, mm, unless I get some plantain, cuckoo yam to sell before. Yeah. Look at this farm. Uh, Chainsaw operators, you see they have destroyed some of the cocoa over here. Sometimes you, they will come, tell you that they need only one tree, two trees, but all, are, all of a sudden you see that five, six, and the farm destroyed. And even no, the amount that will be given to you is a meager amount. And uh, before the owner gets to be aware, you know that, hey, things have got spoiled. One man called Nigerian man has fell a mahogany tree, it affected the electricity pool, the high tension, and therefore the whole town is in darkness. So quickly we have to ride down to ECG electricity to arrange for the light to restore. See, it was weekend, it took us three good days before they were able to restore the light. So in three days time we were in darkness. The whole community became angry. The activities of these individuals involved in the legal logging business take place in the deep forest late at night. For the fear of being attacked, the police and the Forestry Commission guards are not able to move in to stop the operations. This is a community called Jinjin in the KJB district of the Volta region. Now, these are areas within the very thick bushes. Around here, there are a number of farms and very tall and huge trees all over the place. Unfortunately, the activities of illegal chainsaw operators are affecting the forest to a very large extent. What you see in the background are woods that were cut down illegally and they've been split, awaiting cutting by the illegal chainsaw operators. Well, you can see the sawdust in the background there, another bit of it showing that 
the oppressions have been quite rampant in this neighborhood. A number of trees have been cut down in this particular neighborhood. A number of farms have also been affected to a large extent. And well, these are items that forestry officials have found a way to confiscate, which is how come they are still sitting on the farms. All other things being equal, these woods would have found their way onto the market and millions and millions of cities would have been gotten out of it by those who have been involved in these illegal trades. Well, the residents here are making a simple demand. They want the security agencies to crack the whip and ensure that any further destruction of the forest is stalled. We've been speaking to some of them around here. Those cutting the trees have no legal documents that allows them to do that. But they are not afraid to come. We had to stop them ourselves before the Forestry Commission and the police personnel came. And there are many of such cut down logs all over in the Jinjin forest in the KJB district. The illegal loggers cut down the trees and gradually pull them together to split into pieces and cut out of the forest when no one is watching. Assembly member for Dodi Pepeso South, Rafael Yabuamenta, says this is biting the community very hard. He accuses officials of the Forestry Commission of being complicit in how these illegal activities thrive. Even when we arrest machines and vehicles and take them to the Forestry Commission, they release them. This is not fair. They then come back in the night to continue the activities. The Forestry Commission should help us. Gilbert Bentumque is a timber merchant. I think uh, some people are destroying our, our, our business in the sense that Instead of them waiting for the logs to ripe, for, for it to get to its, its mature stage before they, they log them, they fell them, you find them just entering the bush and just cutting down anything they see just for money, which is wrong. As a result of the destructions being caused to the environment, food has become expensive in a lot of these forest areas as they hardly get rains. The Papaso South Assembly member, Rafael Yabua Mensa, says the price of maize, for example, has shot up by about 50% over the last one year because of the poor rainfall pattern. Yeah, it's causing them a lot. Because as at now, the farmers, right now, as at now, we haven't seen any corn. There, no corn, like, like the olden days or some time ago. But this time they will be reaping their corn. But not even some of them, they haven't put in even the seed of corn in the soil because of the rainfall pattern. Coordinator of the Volta Regional Farmers Forum, Kofi Yadom, says the negative impact on food security is being felt across the entire region. He wants an expanded government crackdown on the operations of illegal loggers. Of the moment, the climate change has affected the farmers as, as a whole. So the benefit they had is that when the trees have become down, a lot of shortfalls have become on their way. Food stuff have been reduced. Productivity is low. Income generation is also very, very low. It affects the livelihood of the people. That's why the reform pattern it has become worse previously due to failure of the number trees by the illegal chainsaw illegally. So the reform pattern has changed drastically. Mm -hmm. Initially, when we start from May, the reform has gone down. Hopefully by July, that we first see the reform becoming more. So the reform pattern has changed drastically. That's Productivity well. has become very, very low mm -hmm. to the livelihood of the people. Mm -hmm. So the cost price of food has gone very, very high. Government has played that. There must be a lot of task forces. Security agencies must come in the form of soldiers. Water bodies are also bearing the brunt of these illegal logging activities. In the Dodi Papasu area, the Isoko Oya River, which stretches into the Oti and Volta rivers, is brownish after it was polluted by the operations of illegal loggers. They tie ropes around the cut wood and drag them through the river, polluting it. Traditional authorities are not happy. Kennedy Akroma is a local chief. The chainsaw operators tie ropes to the tree stumps and move them through the river just to make money. 
Sano on team di fast sano on di akwa kopie e vote ano so. Sano on yadi e di bahano. Up north, the young business which provides jobs for thousands in farming and trading is being hit badly by the poor weather patterns. On the farm field, some of the farmers get only rotten yarn from their mounds because of the lack of rains. It was planted, but because it was not for raining, it got rotten in the mounds and it has been replaced. Yes, this one was moved and then planted new one there again. But you can't do that the whole farm. If you go to this level of it, if it were to be rain, there would be leaves, more leaves on it. Even when you hide on it, like somebody will not see you will not see you in it. Crops planted this growing season have also not seen water and has begun wilting. Farmers sometimes plant after the first rain, but the seeds dry up and they have to uproot and replant. Over the period, I mean, a period of about uh, uh, three to five years, we've realized that the rains, we get one or two rains at the beginning of the year. Farmers rushing, they prepare their young mount and they plant. And then there is a, a, a drought spell for maybe another two months. And the yam that they have planted get rotten in the young mount. So at the end of the, the, the number of sprouts that they get on the field, uh, less than what they planted. So the uh, change in the rainfall pattern is actually affecting young production. This 37-year-old farmer is afraid he will lose his vehicles to debtors because he borrowed money to invest in this field. So sometimes we can borrow money to farm and it's happened that the rain didn't rain you run loss because when all does not germinate, it will happen that when you are to harvest, you raise thousands of yam mounds and you are getting only 200, two bears of yams. So you cannot sell and pay your debt and still have something for the next year. I borrow 5,000 uh, 5, Ghana cities for the yam seeds and for the power pack. And this time, this, this, this time meal, rain, rain once. At Christmas pass, it rained once. And all the yams has not germinated as I'm here today. But some people are, they want to see you that you have a house, a, a property like a cow walking on the roadside. They will come down, if you don't have that money, they will take this your thing. And then they will seize, and, your, and they will seize your car. Or they will seize your that car. Uh, house. Diwati uh, David Yajedo has a 10 acre farm. He grows maize, yam, granite, and soya bean. He lost about 5,000 Ghana cities last year because all the yam got rotten in the mounds as a result of the pouring for pattern. I lost not less than 5,000 Ghana cities. I did propagation where I need to get more yam cells. And uh, in fact, m almost all of them got rotten in the yam mounds. Jonathan Nabia, also a farmer, lost 2,000 Ghana cities to the poor weather last year. For the yam business there, people don't see us. It was going on well, but looking at this three years now, the way the yams uh, business is going is no more something that's favoring the, what, the, the farmers. About two years now, for the weather, the, it's just something that people are facing a challenge. Why? Uh, we don't know what that, how it came about. The water, the, the rain doesn't come. Uh, it's now affecting now. The yams we've, uh, we've planted is now dying. For the money I've lost, about 2,000 plus. Suleimana Isifu is with the Center for Climate Change and Food Security. Uh, when you look at the trends of rainfall patterns in Ghana, you realize that 2015 were hit with a, a drought of a sort. It, it made us reflect on what happened in 87, when there was a severe drought and hunger all over the country. We've seen that, indeed, um, the concept of climate, climate change is not a myth or it's not something that is uh, imaginary as some people think. The recent upsurge of fall annual is nothing more than uh, one of the consequences of climate change. He says the country stands the risk of severe cases of heat waves 
beyond the flood and drought Ghana is currently grappling with. The study has proven that over the 40 year period, our temperature has risen by one uh, degree Celsius. And there are some projections that by uh, 2030, it will hit 3.6 degrees Celsius. What that means is that Ghana stands at risk of uh, uh, facing um, heat waves. And the north is a very, very uh, volatile area. We know that they are at the two extremes of the uh, weather conditions. When it is raining, flood occurs. And when it is drought, it is very severe. And the extreme, the kind of extremities we've seen in the last two years, it can be nothing more than uh, a consequence of climate change. And when that happens, we know that when flood occurs, plants cannot survive. Cocoa is Ghana's most important cash crop, but its production is being severely hampered by climate change. 44-year-old cocoa farmer in Sefi, Frank Eduhne, explains heavy sunshine burns young pots annually, thereby reducing yield. Since the production is high, we are not able the sunshine turns the pots yellowish, then you need to hire more labor to plug them off the fields. So we need the irrigation dams. He says the situation cost him about 20 bags of cocoa last season. Last year, we were able to get the Last year, because of the climate change, I got only 33 bags from my field instead of 50 because the sun scorched the pots. Frank says illegal tree loggers in the enclave have destroyed large portions of the forests and trees on their farms, exposing them to the impact of climate change. When we started farming here, there were a lot of trees on the field, but the timber merchants came in and cut them all on the authority of the land owner. 2017 National Best Cocoa Farmer, Yakub Wasman, who manages 245 acres of cocoa farms in the western region has similar experience. The cocoa pot can burn up completely. It happened to me two years ago. The risk climate change poses to the cocoa sector is even greater. The projection is that rainfall in a lot of the cocoa growing areas will decline by 2% in the year 2020 and 11% in 2050 and result in a 14 and 28% decline in cocoa productivity respectively. By 2080, moisture is predicted to be inadequate for profitable cocoa production in Ghana if the current trend continues. Whether it's on the cocoa farm itself or it's in the neighboring communities, it provides the enabling microclimate, climatic conditions for the cocoa to grow. Yes, so what it means is that it's simple. I mean, without the trees, there's no cocoa. And you can look at the rest of Ghana. I mean, it's simple. Where in the past we had good forests, we had good cocoa. Now where the forests are gone, there's virtually no cocoa. So what we have to do is to bring the forest back, the forest back so that we continue to, to enjoy our, our cocoa as it as a country. The ideas on possible solutions are several. Farmers are asking government to speed up work on the One Village, One Dam project to help irrigate farms. They told us that we need bigger dam instead of what they were coming to give us. And that some people will come as surveyors to come and survey the place and give us that dam. Up to date, no one has come, up, uh, come back again. So we don't really know what is going to happen. When there is loss of forest, the land on which agricultural production happens fragments, soils get exposed, and there is loss of soil nutrients. Agriculture becomes less productive. Plant breeder Dr. Emmanuel Chamba also advocates for the adoption of improved drought resistant seeds. It means we've got to be developing varieties that will fit into this shrinking rainy season. 
so that if the variety used to uh, mature in, let's say, uh, five, six months, you should be thinking of a variety now that will be maybe three, four months uh, maturity period. Uh, and also, we should have to be thinking about drought resistant uh, varieties. Um, varieties that will be able to stand the drought period. Even fishing activities are being hampered by climate change, as fisheries expert Dr. Angela Lamte points out. They go to sea and they can't find fish because most of them have either been affected by climate change or changes in the environment or might have migrated to nearby water bodies where conditions are more favorable. So this brings about food security issues. When the temperatures are not favorable, fishes will not spawn. Once they do not spawn, they will not produce young ones. Even if they manage to spawn, the fish eggs that may hatch into larvae may not even survive the harsh conditions in the environment. Even if they catch only the adults and leave the juveniles, because of climate change, the juveniles that are left in the water will not even survive, make it to the adult stage and also spawn or breed. Director of the Institute for Environmental and Sanitation Studies at the University of Ghana, Professor Kwesia Pieningado, says a concerted effort is needed to tackle the problem else the entire nation is at risk. As a country, we can help you know, reduce the impact of climate change by ensuring that we maintain our forests. You know, we also need to embark on tree planting and uh, as much as possible activities that will reduce carbon, in the, I mean, carbon or CO2 in the system should be encouraged. Uh, that is what I think we as a country can do. But the impact of climate change is not going to reduce if we don't help to reduce the global you know, effect of climate change. Um, we now see a lot of flooding. We see a lot of you know, increased coastal erosion. All these are connected in a way to climate change because sea level is rising. And if the sea level is rising, definitely the vulnerable areas are going to be flooded. But moving into the future, if we hit the 1.5 degree threshold of increasing in temperature, then um, the impact is going to be severe. So the frequency is going to increase. These things are not going to stop. It's everybody's business to ensure that the current rate of deforestation stops. Maybe someday when the reality of the destructive effect of climate change becomes inevitable, you will understand this old Native American saying that it is when the last tree has been cut down, when the last fish is caught, and the last river poisoned, only then will we realize that one cannot eat money. For Hotline, Joseph Opokugapo reporting. Global warming through more tree, tree planting, it will reduce the scorching effect of the heat Already we can feel 1.5 degree increase. Don't take it for granted. The next 10 years, 2030, you'll be around. Some of us would be dead and gone. Please, let's recultivate the habit. It'll reduce just a little. Be public It's life. It's our life. It's our future. Okay?